Oh, hi, I'm Mark. I used to be a senior artist at Blizzard Entertainment, and now I teach art for a living when I'm not stuck in this forest. In this episode of my weekly series, YouTube Art School, I'm going to show you how to paint simple nature environments. I'll demo how I paint grassy grounds, foliage, trees, and how to combine it all to create dreamy landscape paintings without even mentioning perspective or vanishing lines. <laughs> I'll even go over different levels of difficulty so that you have something to practice if you can't do it all just yet. Environments like these might seem complicated, but it's a lot simpler than you might think. I'll prove it. Let's get this class started. Ugh! Classes in session. Pay attention. Also, pay the fee to watch the class. It's not free. You really thought I'd give away for free knowledge I've spent my entire career acquiring? If you want to keep watching the video, you gotta pay the fee of either one like or one sub. It's the law. I have no way of checking though, so don't steal. I'm counting on you. Now, today we'll be going over how to paint simple environments, no man made structures just good old nature. Of course, just because something is simple doesn't necessarily make it easy. But as usual, I'll try to break down my process in just a few simple steps so that it is as easy as possible. These environments that we'll be working on could be used for things like backgrounds for your character art. That's usually what I'll use mine for most of the time, but it could also be used as environment concept art pieces for your portfolio if you don't plan to add any characters in there. So many possibilities. Now, we'll be focusing on forests, forest clearings, plains, that kind of stuff. But let me know if there's any interest in exploring different types of environments for future videos, maybe. Anyways, the key when painting environments is that you should not be painting every little detail yourself and instead rely on custom brushes as much as possible. That's going to save you a lot of time. That's a good thing. So here are some of the main brushes that I'll be using in this class. We're going to be looking at these five in particular. So the first one here, MB, line art. This is, well, one brush that I use for line art, yes, but also a brush that's very good for uh, for branches and stuff like that. So this is the brush that I use for most of my trees and most of my little branches. Now, it might not look that impressive right there, but if we switch that to a mixer brush and maybe source something like this that has a little bit of shading, now when we draw, well, the shading comes with. And so when you draw these little branches here, it's going to look like it's in 3D already. It's a mixer brush miracle. Next, we have the brush that I'll be using for most of the most of the foliage. So it's going to be the MB bush right here. This one's going to be great for dense, big foliage like this. In this particular case here, the, the pen tilt impacts the, uh, the direction of the brush a little bit. So it allows you to create some pretty dynamic trees or bushes. Next, we have MB foliage one. These are going to be great for like up close foliage, that kind of stuff where you would need maybe a little bit more detail. I have another one here that's very similar, foliage two, just to uh, to introduce a little bit of variety. And then finally, MB grass, which is going to be just some good old grass here. Once again, not super exciting in this normal mode, but if you switch that to mixer brush, sourcing from something like that, that has shading already, and you can get some pretty cool grass for free. Wow, nice. And I've added those brushes to my advanced painter set that you can find in the top right corner of the screen right here or down in the description below. Also, I added one of my favorite brushes that uh, that we just saw, MB Bush, to my starter set. So you can go ahead and grab that for free in the top right corner here of the screen. But if you already had the set, you probably got an email about it. So just go ahead and download the update. What are you waiting for? Use them responsibly. I will say though, it's always better to go ahead and create your own custom brushes. And these weren't too hard to make because the more familiar you are with your custom brushes, the more you can get out of them. And this is particularly true for environments. Okay, next up, we'll go over some principles that you should keep in mind while you're painting to help create something believable. This is super basic stuff. We're not gonna dive in too deep here on YouTube, but these simple principles should still help make a huge difference if you follow them. Some of this might be pretty obvious if you have some experience already, but it might also be something that you never considered. So let's not take any chance and go over the four principles in question. 
values, colors, scale, and direction. So the first principle, values, this is going to essentially be that everything that is further back in a scene will have decreased value range, aka less contrast. For everything that's closer in the scene, right here, closer to the, to the viewer, closer to us, we'll have more contrast to play with, brighter highlights, darker shadows. And so to make something appear further away, far in the distance, you would decrease the contrast a lot, kind of like those mountains in the background here. We can tell there are some details, but the contrast is so low that we can't tell much. Meanwhile, here a little bit closer to, to us in the scene, we have these trees, these bushes. As you can see here, the values go a little bit darker because we're playing with a wider value range. And then if we add something even closer to the viewer here, then we go even darker. And yeah, to check your values, the best way is to do it in black and white so that you're not distracted with any colors. And you can really make sure as best as you can that everything that is closer to the viewer is going to have a little bit more contrast compared to everything that's in the background. Don't do that and everything is going to look pretty flat. All right, let's bring back some colors in here and tackle the second principle, colors. And here, the main point that I wanted to make is similarly to the values, with depth, with distance, the colors are going to change. In the landscape painting, such as something like this, where we're outside and we can see the sky, with distance, everything is going to take up a little bit of a blue tint. I think we can easily tell the difference in here in the foreground, we have, well, we have just some normal grass. And then in the far distance, this mountain back there, obviously the grass over there is not blue. There's no such thing. I mean, we can tell there's a little bit of green in here, but it's very blue compared to what's in the foreground. And that's just the effect of atmospheric perspective. So maybe here we can take a look at color of the leaves in the foreground versus the color of the leaves in the shadows again a little further back in the scene and you can tell there's a little bit more blue for the leaves further back in the scene and even more blue for the mountain in the back the next principle scale is going to be a lot more obvious i think and it's just that everything that is closer to the camera is going to appear bigger than everything that's further back in the scene closer to the horizon that's going to look smaller obviously it isn't but we perceive it as such because it's so far away like the trees here in the foreground nice and big versus the trees in the back there that might be the same size really but they will appear to be smaller just because they're further back and then the last principle, the direction. Here we'll just want to pick a destination almost that the eyes should go towards. And so I think the easiest way to approach it is to just imagine that you're in a scene and you're walking along a path. You're walking in one particular direction and you're trying to go somewhere. Where is that? In my case here for this environment, we can see we have like little hills that kind of go in this direction, almost like steps. Here we have the mountain and kind of like the trees here following in that direction as well. So you could imagine if you were walking in the scene here, you might be going towards that point over there. Maybe it's to the right here, outside of the canvas. Maybe it's within the canvas. It doesn't really matter. Just imagine there's a little path in here that a person would be able to follow and arrange all your elements around that. You don't need an actual path, like in here I don't have one, but imagine there's one. Like if I bring back my other layers, well, I actually have one here in the foreground, but once again, you can see all the elements are kind of arranged around around this path here, this clearing, and this is the destination. This is where we're going. But let's say I had placed a tree right here in the middle and there were no path anywhere. It just makes it really hard for the eye to focus on anything. Imagining a path like this naturally kind of creates a focal point, and that's going to create a much more compelling environment. Now, with all of that in mind, let's take a look at my recipes to create the individual components of the landscapes, like uh, the grounds the bushes or the, the small plants closer to the ground, the trees, and then the overall recipe to combine all of that in a nice way. For each, I'll show two levels of complexity. So start practicing with level one, which is going to be great for parts of the landscape that are farther away from the viewer, since it'll contain less detail. And then focus on level two for the more complex versions with more details. You would typically use level two for stuff that's closer to us in the scene, since just like in real life, we can always appreciate more details for things that are up close. And using those few recipes alone should allow you to get a lot of variety in your landscapes, a great starting point. Those recipes are basically what I use to create 90% of the environments that uh, I'll show today. The extra 10% is other stuff like you know, flowers, mountains in the background, that kind of stuff. So the first thing that we'll um, take a look at here is the ground, how to draw the ground. So what's not interesting is something like this. Let's say you had a ground that was completely flat, where you can see all of it, just like a floor. 
In nature, that's pretty damn rare. Most of the time, the ground instead will be uneven, not flat. And so at any given time, you won't be able to see the whole of it, right? And the second example here being this person looking at looking at this scene. Well, maybe there's going to be a little bump in the ground here, and that'll make it so that it's impossible to see what's behind it. And so the view will be blocked. Everything that's in red here is stuff that you can't see. In green, stuff that you can see. And so from the perspective of this viewer, we'll see the start of a little cliff, and then the top of it, and then nothing. And then right behind that, we'll see another cliff, and then another. This is what I recommend that you do when drawing the ground of any environments that you do. That's in nature. Now here to demonstrate this effect, um, this example would be the equivalent of the first example, the bad example, where we can see the entire surface of the ground, right? Nothing is obstructed. We can see pretty much everything, but it's just this, this flat, boring surface, void of features. But the second that you introduce a little bit of unevenness into the environment, then you can start to get something like this. That feels a lot more interesting. And we can see the different, the different layers here. So we have layer number one there. Behind that, we have another layer and then another and then another. And to shade these different layers properly, all you have to think about are just simple volumes. So imagine each of these little sections, each of these little bumps is just like a big sphere, the top of a big sphere. Something like this, maybe. So you could crop out the bottom. We're not going to need that. And the top of that sphere, that is what would become those little hills. Of course, you can deform them, squash them, rotate them in position. And just like with everything else in the scene, just like we saw with the scale principle here, we'll want those different sections to be closer and closer together with distance and farther and farther apart, the closer they are to um, to the viewer here, creating this kind of rhythm where the frequency gets higher and higher with distance. So that would be kind of level one. And then level two, for stuff that's closer up in the scene, right at the top of each of those little hills, we can add a little bit of bushes here, a little of foliage to make that layering effect even more visible. Once again, help create a sense of scale where those details get, get bigger, the closer to the camera they are. So whether the scale is massive or whether it's super small, always, always try to introduce some overlapping like this, some layering effect of your ground components. Much more exciting than just a flat surface. Now let's move on to level one foliage or like bushes, like that kind of stuff here. When I think level one, I think distance. And so it's going to be stuff that's further back in the scene. I'm not going to need a whole lot of details. And so something like this would do great as like a base starting point and always starting with a darker bluish color, bluish green. That's going to be the color for our shadows and then slightly lighter, slightly more saturated, slightly warmer green for, um, for the highlights. Of course, if you don't have a brush like this, you can just manually draw it out and kind of just create a selection like this and do that instead. Maybe chop out some, some bits here. You can achieve very similar results. Don't need a brush for that, but it certainly does help speed things up. So anyways, that would be that would be level one. Pretty simple. Now, what would a level two bush look like? Well, it would be very similar. It starts the same way and then we just detail it more. Starting with the base color here. Maybe we start with a little bit of shadow on the ground around where the bush is going to be then apply the base color, usually starting from darker colors and building our way up to lighter colors. Now, since we are working with a little bit more details, I like to introduce more colors as well for the for the leaves. So in the back here, we only had two colors for the bushes. We're going to introduce maybe like another one for the leaves that might be reflecting the, uh, the color of the sky a little bit more. So slightly more blue that would be for the sky color. We can start to blend some a little bit here introduce some uh, some fuzziness so that we can see all the details super clearly. Too much detail sometimes can be a little overwhelming. And then the highlights for color of the sky. Once again, a little bit of a blendy action in here. Some overall shadows to break up the patches of green, creating smaller clusters of leaves. And then maybe I'm um, drawing some, some branches in here. And then maybe top this off with a little bit of a extra light there. And then we'll just want to integrate that into the actual ground by maybe having a little bit of a, a little bit of grass in front. And then final details with a brush that has a little bit more information, a little bit more detail information in there. And really quickly like this, you can get um, you know, decent looking bushes. Like everything else in art though, use references. If you're not sure what a bush should look like, if you're thinking to yourself, I need a little bit more realism than that, find some good references and use that as your source material. But this process here is exactly how I tackle creating bushes. Now, moving on to trees. So trees are going to be very similar, so not going to take too long. For the trees, I start with the actual trunk, always starting with big mass and then as we split out into branches that mass diminishes and so the branches get smaller and smaller every time they branch out now when you have the equivalent of like a, a dead tree like this time to slap some colors on here so the trunk since it's away from the foliage it's always going to get a little bit more a little bit more light 
So I like to kind of darken the top of the tree here, the top of the branches, and shade the tree so that it's kind of like a cylinder where the edges are a little darker than the center. And then from here, it's very similar to the bushes. So we start with kind of like the base, the base shape with a darker color for our leaves. Go pretty thick in some areas and then move on to the highlights. Boom, a little bit of a little bit of smudge action again. Maybe some overall shading to make this look a little bit more round. So extra highlights towards the top. And that's a level one tree, easy. Now a level two tree will just be, yeah, just a more detailed version of the same thing. So starting with the trunk, and here I'm going to source this part of the tree there, the mixer brush so that I can get some, some nice texture up close. There you go, just something so that it's not just completely flat. From here, once again, we'll want to darken kind of like the top of the tree. On top of that, maybe we can add some, some slight imperfections, like a splatter brush, something similar. And then we can smudge this in some areas to break up the pattern. And then we can continue extending out those branches, again, starting big and then tapering down. And from there, we can start to slap on some leaves in here so some in front of the tree some darker leaves behind the tree some lighter leaves where the sun hits more directly and then some extra some extra branches in here and then lastly some overall kind of shading some extra shadows against the light source and some highlights for uh, well for the leaves that are facing the light source a bit more directly a little bit of contrast adjustment here so that uh, we have a little bit more of it versus the stuff in the background because we're closer Remember the four principles that we discussed? But yes, there you go. Boom, the level two tree. So now moving on to the fourth recipe that I wanted to cover today, how to tie all of that together, the ground, the bushes and the trees. Now how to create something that would give us like a simple ground plane. That would be, that could be the foreground here, here that could be the middle ground and then you can have another one for the background. So the anatomy of these ground planes here, actually quite simple. You have in front of it all, a surface of grass, a surface of ground. Then right behind that, we're going to plop the trees and the bushes, the foliage in front of the trees to hide kind of like the base of the trunk. And behind all of that, of course, we're gonna have a sky plane. So super simple, three components, the ground, then the bushes, then the trees behind it all. And that is exactly what we have right here. Background, that could be just clouds or it could be just the sky. Then in front of everything, we're going to have the ground itself, behind that, the bushes, and then behind that, the trees. And that's how you piece together a simple landscape. Now, what's cool with that is that you can take one of those layers, one of those planes, like this one here, maybe that's a plane, that's a rough one, a little bit more rough than the other ones, but then overlap them with more planes. Another one in front, another one in front, another one in front, oh my God. And this way you can get a lot of depth. And not only that, but you can kind of mix and match them. So maybe I remove the two middle planes and I'm left with something like this. Maybe I remove the background here, then maybe add this one back in, or hide that one, bring this one in, or both of them. Maybe hide the foreground. A lot of super cool stuff that we can do. If we want to make one plane, for example, make, take up more space, we can just slide that up here and that one becomes a little bit more dominant. You can do the same here with any of these. But yeah, what's cool when you build your ground planes that way is that you can easily layer them on top of each other to add depth. You just gotta make sure that you keep in mind, you know, the four principles that we saw at the beginning. And that's gonna be it for today's class. <laughs> oh wait, there's more. I mentioned the free brush at the beginning of the video, but the freebies just keep on coming today. I'll be uploading the full PSD that I worked on to the pack of exercise files that I have up on my uh, QBrush store. So you can grab that for free right here in the top right corner of the screen and down below. If you use the brushes or you know try any of the recipes that I showed today, don't hesitate to tag me on Twitter or tag me on your Instagram stories. I love to see what you guys create. Who knows, I might also reshare it and send a bunch of traffic your way in the process. And finally, thanks for all the support so far. We just reached 600,000 subscribers on the channel and uh, that's pretty cool, bruh. Onwards to one million.